gets into the low branches easily. Cornered. The mother has no option but to meet her fate on the ground. At dawn, JV and Elman scour the mother's territory and find what they fear. Their leopard, brutally injured, dying. Her wounds cut to the bone. They watch as life slips from her torn body, and their window into the world of leopards closes. JV and Elman try to follow other leopards, particularly the mother's daughter, named Tugwan Female. But Tugwan's nature is a far cry from her mother's. She's temperamental and aggressive, and they track her with extreme caution. So when they see her leave to hunt, they recognize a rare opportunity to get down to her den and see if she has cubs. What JV finds changes his life. A tiny female cub emerges from the den. It's Manana. Ten days old. JV's window into the world of leopards opens once more. As a single parent, Tugwan must hunt, or she and the cubs will starve. So, in their first weeks of life, Manana and her brother are often left unguarded at the den. Lions and hyenas kill the offspring of other predators to eliminate the competition. And unguarded leopard cubs are soft targets. But the dense bush and cavernous rocks of the Tugwan riverbed protect this den like a fortress allowing Manana and her brother to hone their skills in relative safety. New creatures awaken their earliest hunting instincts. But it takes a little longer to grow into climbing. makes perfect, and soon the trees become their preferred playground. And everything in them, fair game. Manana soon learns that tackling prey that bites and hisses is harder than it looks. She heads down after easier prey. As the cubs grow, so too will the size of their prey, until at one year, they will be ready to catch full-grown antelope alone.
as adults, the treetops of Lundalozi will become their domain. The dense woodlands are perfect leopard habitat, abounding with a diversity of prey. But with that prey comes other, larger predators. Manana learns early in her solitary adult life that catching prey is only the first hurdle. Keeping it is always a far tougher task. death rattle of the Impala goes up like a flag, alerting wandering hyenas to the kill. They'll stop at nothing for a free meal, and with a bite that can crack bone, they make deadly enemies. Manana is in mortal danger. Seconds after Manana makes the kill, Spotted hyenas surround her. Alone and outnumbered, she can't afford to fight. The hyenas, on the other hand, can't help fighting. A strict hierarchy gut feeding. With so many mouths, Underlings must be kept out by force. Soon, the feeding frenzy turns into a riot, allowing Manana to sneak in and steal back her carcass. This time, she hauls it out of reach before the hyenas know what's happened. She eats her fill while she can, but hyenas are relentless. A scout remains to stake out the tree and wait for Manana to make a mistake. Leopards inevitably lose kills to predators. But when Manana bears her first litter, the stakes change. Predators are a constant, mortal threat to leopard cubs. Here in the Kruger National Park, they kill one and two infants. But even at only four years old, Manana proves to be an excellent mother. Her den sites are all but invisible. She moves the cubs every few days to keep the predators guessing. Never staying in one den long enough to build up a telltale scent trail. But there is one enemy that Manana cannot outwit. And JV knows it all too well. A female leopard, which we call Sunset Bend female, contracted psychoptic mange. And I believed at that time that it was a natural process and that I should not interfere. And I watched and filmed while she deteriorated and eventually died. 
and filming her body, I realized I had it within my power to save her life. And I'd let her go. When Manana and her cubs contract the same mage, he is forced to make a controversial decision. Sarcoptic mange is caused by a mite that eats away the skin. In the wild, it's a death sentence. But this time, JV won't stand by and watch Manana die. To treat the mange, JV will dart a drug called Ivermectin directly into Manana and her cubs. Elman tracks Manana to a dense grove of trees. One cub is on the ground below. The other in the low branches. They must move fast. The darts will hurt. Manana may see it as an attack on her and the cubs and fight back. One of the few times when the dart hit Manana that I saw her really angry. The risk is worth it. Three weeks later, Manana and the cubs make a full recovery. JV's intervention gives Manana another 14 years of life. And her cubs survive the ordeal to become some of Lundalozi's most successful leopards. But Manana's next litter is not so lucky. A new threat terrorizes her territory. Male leopards. Territorial males kill cubs that aren't there so that females can bear their cubs instead. When two competing males invade Lundalozi from either side, it turns into a killing spree, as they repeatedly destroy each other's offspring. After losing two consecutive litters, Manana makes a move to end the slaughter. She seeks out one of the males and entices him to mate. Like domestic cats, Microscopic spines on the male's genitalia make mating a painful process for the female. A process she must repeat every 50 minutes, day and night, for up to five days straight. The repeated couplings force Manana's body to ovulate and help to ensure conception. When the ordeal finally ends, she crosses her territory to find the other male and endures it all over again. with both males, Manana deceives them into thinking the resulting cubs will be theirs. 
It's an extraordinary strategy that only a few lepers have ever been seen to employ. And it pays off. Three months later, she has a single tiny cub. Usually, there are two or three cubs in a litter. Lions may abandon single cubs to bear larger litters. But Manana chooses to keep this only child. The rocky den hides many inaccessible crevices, and its perimeter is guarded by dense thorn trees. The lion or hyena will have to work hard to reach the cub. Manana leaves it safely concealed in the rocks and heads off to hunt. But today, Manana's not the only predator on the prowl. There is one killer that can breach the den's defenses. And it's moving in, whilst Manana's attentions are elsewhere. Hunt failed. Manana heads home. She gives a soft contact call for her cub, but there is no answer. Something is wrong. It takes only a second to recognize the killer. An African rock python, swollen with a cub-sized meal. Nana risks her own life as she attacks her cub's killer. The python retreats into the thorns. But Manana will not give up. For three hours, she lies silently, staking out the python's cave. At last, her patience pays off. The injured python finally makes a move. Manana is ready for the next round. She waits until it's clear of the cave. No battle. A built-in reflex forces the snake to relinquish its hard-won meal. Under stress, pythons regurgitate their prey to shed the extra weight for a speedy escape. But Manana has abandoned the attack. She's got what she came for.
off to the python to scourge to cup. I thought Manana would go after that python and kill it. But there was no act of revenge. All she wanted was her tiny cub back. We tend to think of leopards as instinctive and animals without emotion. That is completely untrue. Manana carries the body away from the den and begins to consume it. Manana knows that her cub is gone. By eating that cub, I believe that she was going through a ritual. She was going through a ceremony, disposing of the cub. It was one of the most emotional times I ever spent with her. And then, incredibly, for four days, she called for a cub that she knew was already dead. As a filmmaker, it's hard to just turn your camera on and capture the scene because it cuts very, very deep. Manana's grief is tangible. But losing cubs is a reality all leopard mothers must face. Of Manana's eight litters, only four cubs survived to adulthood. She can't afford to grieve for long. She must ensure her own survival. And to do so, she must hunt. Her 15 meter vantage gives her a bird's eye view on potential prey. An Apollo breaks from the herd. Manana has her target. Now, it's all down to timing. She makes it look easy, but this aerial assault is rarely witnessed. It takes a perfect set of circumstances. The right prey in the right place. Perfect timing. Perfect precision. But it means nothing until her belly is full. She needs to get the kill off the ground quickly. But even the trees aren't always safe. Lions are the leopard's number one enemy in Africa. They're three times her size, and unlike hyenas, lions can climb. Like her grandmother, it's a threat she can't escape. Manana retreats to the highest, thinnest branches and watches as she loses yet another kill. To defend it would be suicide. The pride's forces grow.
but numbers are not always a strength. In hungry pride, every scrap of meat must be fought for. Distracted, Manana makes a swift exit. Barely is one opportunity lost, then another presents itself. A cheetah is on the hunt. They may look similar, but the cheetah is a very different animal to Manana. They're matched in weight, but the cheetah's long, streamlined body is built for speeds of over 100 kilometers an hour. Manana's is built for stealth and strength. This is one opponent Manana can intimidate. Leopards only pick fights they can win, except when it comes to territory. Females will fight to the death for their rights to prey, habitat, and ample den sites. In her prime, Manana is a formidable opponent. She holds Londolozi's best territory for most of her life. But keeping it means fighting often. And risking severe injury. Manana grows older, those injuries begin to take their toll. She's now an old leopard of 16. She's lived more than four years longer than most wild leopards, and her body is shutting down. She can no longer afford to fight for territory. She must watch, humbled, as younger, fitter females mark on her turf and claim the best of her territory. familiar whoop gets her attention. A much-needed meal could await nearby. Scavenging from the hyenas that played her youth now helps to keep her alive as an old lady. As usual, 
They fight over who has the right to feed. It's getting tougher and tougher for her to hunt. See if she can scavenge some meat from this kill. We'll keep it going for a while. And as the meat gets separated and spread around, she may have a chance to pick up a piece of meat and jump into a tree. But while there's so many hyenas, it's very, very dangerous for her to go in now. She walks a dangerous tightrope. Scavenged meat could keep her alive. But if she's discovered, the hyenas may attack. She's safe in a tree, but she's trapped. The hyenas will show no mercy if she comes down. Manana waits for hours in the blazing sun. Until the hyena matriarch makes off with the last of the carcass. With the hyenas fat and fed, it's safe to come down at last. The ordeal has cost her precious energy. Energy she will struggle to replace. Six months down the line, every day of life from Inanna is one that JV doesn't expect. He heads out regularly to check up on her. She's in the treetops, and she's seen something. She'll eat anything she can catch now, no matter how small. Nanana used to be so fast, so strong, but now she's nearly 17. She's had to adapt to catching smaller prey. She's caught this monitor lizard, but still surviving, still using every trick to ensure her survival. She's very old. She can't have long to go. JV moves to sit with her, perhaps for the last time. Okay, my goodie. In just a few weeks, she will be 17. A record age for a wild leopard. The equivalent of 85 human years old. Okay, go. <laughs> he chuffs to her. A sound of reassurance that she would use to calm her cubs. Okay, go. Okay, girl. Okay, girl. <laughs> he does not fear her nor she him they have earned each other's trust There are few people who could lie a body's length from a wild leopard. But JV knows his time with her is drawing to a close.
soon the day comes where JV no longer finds Manana anywhere in her territory. And he knows she is gone. When I go out into the bush at Lonelozi, I expect to see Manana around every tree. But of course, this incredible leopard is gone. Truly fascinating creature. The male hippo stands at about 1,5 meters tall and has been known to weigh up to two tons. Every school child knows that hippos need fresh water in which to fully submerge and support this huge mass. The water also needs to be drinkable and their preferred feeding places are within one to two kilometers of good water that is at least 1,5 meters deep. They can swim on the water's surface or underneath, remaining submerged for up to six minutes. Nostrils and ears can be closed to prevent water ingress. This yawn, where the hippo displays the tusks, is a sign of dominance and a signal to intruders to keep away. At dusk, hippos leave the water to graze through the night. 99% of their food intake is fresh grass. Yet hippos don't actually eat as much as you might expect, given their huge body size, approximately 12 kilograms a day. Hippos give the impression of looking a lot more docile than they really are, but beware. They are officially classified as the most dangerous mammals on the African continent. Stay away from hippos and take extreme care if planning to view them. Male giraffes in the southern African Lowfelt stand at 5,5 meters at head height. They are larger than the females and have two felt-like horns which are thicker. The front legs are straddled with the knees bent to reach down and drink water. In this position the giraffe is very vulnerable. They only drink if water is available but can survive without it. The mother stays closely protective of her calf. This mother-child bond lasts until her next calf is born and the maturing calf has learned the life skills needed to survive. Young giraffe are regularly killed by lions. Only about half survive their first year. These giraffe are feeding on protein-rich leaves and shoots at the top of acacia trees in the Kruger National Park, the most important source of food for giraffes. Twigs and branches are pulled into the mouth by the giraffe's long tongue. Small twigs are chewed and swallowed, including the thorns. They also eat the flowers and pods of certain trees. All is washed down with large quantities of digestive saliva. Notice that they soon move on from one tree to the next. This is because the acacia tree has a natural built-in defense mechanism. When eaten, the tree exudes a bitter chemical substance, tetanin noxious to giraffes, so they have to be quick to avoid the bitter substance contaminating their food. The Hemsbok, with its characteristic long horns and three-colored hide, is a desert animal, adapted to survive in regions without surface water. They're commonly found across Namibia and Botswana. These Hemsbok are filmed in the Kalahari. Hemsbok obtain their water by digging for bulbs, tubers, roots and desert fruit. They graze principally at night, when their body temperature is cooler and the moisture content of the grazing is higher. Both males and females make full use of their long sharp horns for fighting, to demonstrate dominance. In contests, bulls sometimes stab backwards over their shoulder, puncturing their adversary with their tips. The horns are also used for defense, slashing against their predators, such as hyena. Long-legged and slim, these cats are built for speed. Unlike the leopard, the spots are single and not formed in groups of rosettes. There are also distinctive black tear spots. This is a massive creature, standing up to 1,8 meters high at the shoulder, with males weighing up to more than two tons. The white rhino is distinguished from the black rhino by its broader muzzle and wide lips. Mm. 
Here is a female with her calf typically at her foot. Cows are ferociously protective of the young and will charge to protect them. The mature bulls tend to be solitary and territorial, marking out their territory with their feces. When meeting submissive neighbors at their boundaries, they rub horns amicably. Fights usually occur over territorial disputes and females. Rhinos have developed an extraordinary thick skin to provide protection from lethal horn sparring. Rhinos need grassland to survive. They are heavy grazers, combined with water. They prefer a flat habitat and plenty of cover for protection. They spend 50% of the day grazing on fresh grass and drink water in the afternoon and night. As you can see, they also eat soil for its minerals. These rhinos are mud bathing to provide protection from ticks and other parasites and to keep their skin cool in the sweltering tropical heat of Kruger National Park. You will notice that the female's horns are shorter than the bull's. Rhinos can live to a venerable 40 to 45 years. They've been heavily poached throughout history, mainly for their horns. And conservation programs and patrolling operations have been very instrumental in protecting them in the second half of the 20th century from near extinction in southern Africa. Today there are several thousand white rhinos in Kruger National Park and Umfalozi Kluwe, and their numbers are increasing. The other cat of the big five, the leopard's distinguishing black spots, are grouped in clusters of rosettes, unlike the cheetah's jewel spots. Adaptable and resilient, leopards are able to survive in a wide range of varying habitats and live right across South Africa, even not far from urban areas and in and around farmland as well as arid zones. This leopard, filmed in the Kruger National Park, has taken its prey high into a marula tree to eat it without being harassed by scavengers. They eat and hunt anything, from small rodents to larger antelope, reptiles, fish, primates and birds, depending on the habitat. Interestingly for a cat, they also eat fruit. They hunt principally at night, but during daytime too, especially where good cover is afforded, by stalking to within 10 meters of the prey, followed by a short chase and a pounce to kill, delivered by a bite to the skull, neck or throat. The leopard is a solitary cat, unlike the lion. Both sexes mark out a territory with urine. The male's territory overlaps the female territories, allowing him privileged access to the females for mating, and vice versa, the female's access to the male's food. These are African buffalo, the fourth of the big five. Much like thick-set, heavily built cattle in appearance, buffalo have characteristic horns. Thick, wrinkled bosses across the forehead, from which the horns protrude sideways and downwards, curving upwards to the tips. These are large, bulky animals that need to eat a lot, almost 20 kilograms per day of protein-rich grasses, preferably, and other greenery. Buffalo are sensitive to heat and need plenty of water. Here they are enjoying a watering hole, drinking and wallowing to cool off in the afternoon heat. They often need a drink twice a day and need habitats that have plenty of rainfall. As well as the cooling effect, wallowing is also part of the buffalo's social activity. The way of... Willkommen in Afrika. Nehmen Sie Platz und begleiten Sie Kevin und Mara bei der aufregendsten Safari Ihres Lebens. Eine atemberaubende Reise von der namibischen Skelettküste über den ganzen afrikanischen Kontinent bis zum Gipfel des Kilimanjaro. Zu Land, zu Wasser und in der Luft freuen Sie sich auf die Schönheit Afrikas, den spektakulären, nie dagewesenen 3D. Produziert vom 3D-Pionier Ben Schlossen. Sie nicht, nach dir Zelt zu schließen. Das sind Löwen im Camp. Keine Ahnung, wie viele. 
Dieses 3D-Abenteuer wird die aufregendste Reise ihres Lebens. African Safari 3D Entdecken Sie Afrika hautnah.